right, good evening. Thank you all for coming. Carnegie is proud to partner with NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program this evening, and we welcome you here for our speakers. Uh, my name is Margaret Mershon, and I'm the science deputy at the Carnegie Institution for Science. Several years ago, a documentary airing on the National Geographic Channel called Last Days of Man, Top 10 Ways to Extinction, examined 10 disasters that had the capability of annihilating the human race. Number six on that list was the threat posed by purported intelligent beings on other worlds in the universe. Worlds whose inhabitants, if they came to Earth, would come not as friends, but as enemies. As Stephen Hawking famously said a few years ago, we only have to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. <laughs> However true these sentiments might be, they seem not to have dampened our curiosity. We Earthlings have designed and carried out hundreds of experiments to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The most recent, Breakthrough Listen, the most ambitious to date, was launched just this year in July. All of these efforts have met so far with silence. <laughs> All have failed to answer the question posed in 1950 by the physicist Enrico Fermi. If the universe is filled with billions of stars, and some stars have Earth-like planets, and some Earth-like planets have intelligent life, and some intelligent life have advanced civilizations that include space travel, why haven't we heard from them? In other words, where is everyone? We're not much closer to finding an answer to this question, but within the last few years, astronomers have located several potential targets. Since 1995, in fact, some 2,000 exoplanets have been confirmed in the Milky Way. Of those planets that orbit sun-like stars, astronomers estimate that about 20% appear to be in habitable zones where liquid water could exist. Will any of these planets harbor signs of life? That's the $64,000 question. But it's not the only question that enthralls astronomers. For hundreds of years, there has been only one solar system to study. With the discovery of thousands more, astronomers can now begin to better understand not only how planets form, but why there are planets at all. Tonight, the Carnegie Institution and NASA's Exoplanet Exploration Program have teamed up to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the first exoplanet discovery. We welcome three scientists deeply involved in this effort. Carnegie's R. Paul Butler and Alan Boss, and NASA's Natalie Battaglia who will each speak for about 15 minutes before we open for questions from you. First, some introductions. Dr. Butler is an astronomer at Carnegie's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism here in Washington and is one of the world's premier planet hunters. The hundreds of exoplanets he has discovered include the first planet to transit its host star, the first planet with less than Saturn's, the first Neptune mass planet, and the first terrestrial mass planet. Dr. Butler received a BA and an MS in physics and a BS in chemistry from San Francisco State University, and in 1993, a PhD in astronomy from the University of Maryland. Throughout his career, he has made contributions not only in exoplanet discovery, but in the methods used to find them, especially the Doppler velocity technique, the most precise planet hunting method to date. Dr. Butler is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the recipient of a Bioastronomy Medal from the International Astronomical Union and a Henry Draper Medal from the National Academy of Sciences. In 2003, he was named Space Scientist of the Year by Discover Magazine. Tonight, he will give us some historical perspectives about the exoplanet revolution. Next up will be Natalie Battaglia to report on the progress made by the orbiting space observatory, Kepler, which NASA launched in 2009 to search for exoplanets in habitable zones in a portion of the Milky Way. Dr. Battaglia holds a BS in physics from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD from UC Santa Cruz. She served for 10 years as a professor at San Jose State University before joining the NASA Ames Research Center, where she currently is the mission scientist for Kepler and where she leads an effort to understand more fully the Milky Way's planet populations. In 2011, she received a NASA Public Service Medal for her vision in communicating Kepler's mission to the public and for outstanding leadership in coordinating the Kepler science team. In 2015, she joined a new initiative, NASA's Nexus for Exoplanet System Science, which is dedicated to the search for evidence of life beyond the solar system.
following Dr. Battaglia's presentation to discuss the future of exosolar astronomy, Louis Carnegie's Alan Boss, a colleague of Paul Butler's of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. Dr. Boss is especially known for his many contributions to the theoretical study of planetary system formation, especially the gas giants and binary star systems. He is, as well, an observational astronomer and has for the last decade been deeply involved in the Carnegie Astrometric Planet Search Project at the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. Dr. Boss received his BS from the University of South Florida and his MA and PhD in physics from UC Santa Barbara. Before joining Carnegie in 1981, he was a research associate at NASA Ames Research Center in California. A fellow of numerous scientific societies and academies, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he regularly chairs working groups in his field. He's written two books about the search for extraterrestrial planets, has received two NASA Group Achievement Awards for his work, and was for many years a member of the NASA Science Working Group for the Kepler mission. Our panelists are all pioneers opening new worlds and starting a new era in space exploration. Please join me in a round of applause for Alan Boss, Natalie Battaglia, and Paul Butler. Thank you, everyone. Uh, normally, I have technical assistance getting my talks going because I'm clueless, but we're going to see if I can get this to go. I have the wrong talk. I am totally clueless. Are you sure you're not a No, this is, I'm clicking the right talk and getting the wrong talk. This is uh, perplexing. Let's see if two PhDs can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's my talk, but it's not my talk. Hmm. There it is, it's hidden under there. There we go. Ooh. I'm sure there's a lot of jokes here about how many PhDs does it take to screw in a light bulb. Uh, so it's a great honor and pleasure to be here tonight uh, celebrating the uh, 20th anniversary of the discovery of the first extrasolar planets. And on an event like this for me, it's uh, especially nice that I can share this with some of my closest collaborators. So we have Steve Sheckman who's uh, hiding over here and Jeff Crane who's also in the audience somewhere. Uh, their work and their genius in designing and building the, the new Carnegie Planet Finding Spectrograph literally has kept me in this field, and so I can't uh, tell you how happy I am that they are here. Um, so uh, I've, I've been assigned probably kind of appropriately uh, the, uh, the history of this field, uh, which seems right because I, I'm feeling more and more like a dinosaur these days. Um, so. Uh, you know, planets were discovered only 20 years ago, but uh, of course, uh, the idea of extrasolar planets go back much further than that. My, my near contemporary, uh, Giordano Bruno, uh, back in the 1580s, uh, wrote a book in which he made these amazing claims that, uh, that stars were like the sun and that uh, they would, the Earth was a planet and that these stars almost all certainly had planets of their own and they might well have life and they might well have civilizations. Um, of course, this is the standard plot of every Star Wars and Star Trek episode that's ever been done, but in these days, in those days, this was really quite an extraordinary thing. And uh, of course, this put Bruno on sort of the, uh, the heretical side of things. And uh, in general, things don't work out too well for heretics. <laughs> The technique that finally led to the discovery of extrasolar planets is the Doppler technique. The obvious thing to do is point your telescope at a star and see the planet. The problem is even giant planets like Jupiter 
are a billion times fainter than their host star, and they're right next to the star. So it's like trying to find a firefly next to a thermonuclear bomb. You can't see it in the glow. So uh, we use, we've used this indirect technique uh, whereby you have a planet orbiting uh, an unseen star. So this is really dangerous. I've got a thing up here. I'm going to guess one of these things is a laser. So you have an unseen planet orbiting the star. That's what we're always told, planets orbit stars. But of course, uh, what's really happening is the planet and the star both orbit a common center of mass. So as the planet orbits the star in a big orbit, it kicks the star into a small counter orbit. So for, you can imagine that for half the orbit, the star is approaching an observer on Earth, and the light from that star will be shifted very su slightly, very subtly, to slightly shorter wavelengths, or astronomers call it blue shifts. For the other half of the orbit, the star will be receding from an observer on Earth, and the light will be shifted to slightly longer wavelengths. And by measuring the amount of this light shift, you can work out the velocity of the star. And if you can see a star that's periodically wobbling, you can infer the presence of a planet. So um, this is not actually all that esoteric. Uh, it's exactly what happens when the highway patrol uses a radar gun to nab you for speeding. So you can see this is one of these techniques that can be used for either good or evil. <laughs> So if we were aliens looking at the solar system uh, with this technique, what would we see? Uh, when I first started showing this diagram something like 20 years ago, I couldn't imagine that we would get this close to 2020. In a couple of years, I'm going to run out of time here. But uh, if uh, we had the sort of precision uh, uh, that we have today and we were looking back at the sun, the primary thing is you'd see the sun wobbling in the sinusoidal, this S-shaped curve uh, with uh, periodic 12-year uh, motion, that's Jupiter. Jupiter takes 12 years to orbit the sun, so the sun makes a counter orbit that's also 12 years. So you immediately get the period of the planet. Uh, the amplitude of the planet, the amount by which it goes up and down, which in the case of Jupiter is roughly 10 meters a second, uh, combined with the period tells you the mass. You can now work out the mass of the planet. And furthermore, the shape of the curve tells you the shape of the orbit. These nice sinusoidal curves tell you that the planet's in a circular orbit. <coughs> You'll also notice that there is uh, something else going on. Here you have a high peak, there you have a low peak, there you have a high peak. Uh, this is due to Saturn. So to first order, you can describe the solar system as consisting of the sun and Jupiter and some garbage. Um, Jupiter is more massive than all the other planets combined. But once you throw out Jupiter, then the next dominant planet is Saturn, which is, again, more massive than all the other remaining planets by far. So with the current technique that we have today, uh, we could hope to detect basically Jupiter and Saturn. The problem with Saturn is the orbital period is about 29 years. So uh, carrying out this technique on Saturn begins to become an issue with life expectancy. So this is what we had been working on going back into the 1980s, and there were no known planets, and people thought we were nuts. And uh, also, everybody knew that all planetary systems would look just like the solar system. So finally, in 1995, Michel Mayor and Didier Collot announced the first bona fide extrasolar planet, 51 Peg. Uh, in fact, Didier is here in the audience. Somewhere. Will Didier stand up? There we go. So th this planet is truly bizarre because you can see the orbital period. This is days. So the orbital period is four days. So there are no four-day planets in the solar system. Furthermore, the amplitude, which is about plus or minus 50 meters a second, tells you this thing is about a half a Jupiter mass. It's a Jupiter-type planet. Well, Jupiter takes 12 years to orbit. Nobody had ever dreamed of such a thing. So this thing was just wild. And this literally began the entire revolution of extrasolar planets. And it was announced, I believe, uh, 20 years and two weeks ago. Uh, so uh, this literally is the, the 20th uh, anniversary of this whole field. And when it was announced, uh, it didn't really get the full amount of publicity that it deserved uh, because of the history of the field. Uh, over the previous 50 or even 100 years, many people had announced the first extrasolar planet ever. And the one thing all of these previous claims had in common was that they were wrong. Uh, so the whole field had sort of a snake oil feel. And furthermore, everybody knew planets like this couldn't exist. 
So uh, uh, we had four nights at Lick Observatory uh, about a week after this was announced, and we were pretty skeptical as well. Uh, so here's our first night, our second night, our third night, and our fourth night. Uh, our computer speeds were very slow. It, it took us a whole additional day beyond this just to reduce the data. But when we saw this, it was actually about uh, midnight between Sunday and Monday, uh, we, we fell off our chairs. Uh, we were absolutely astonished. And at this point, it became the first confirmed extrasolar planet ever. Here you can see the next month of data. And uh, DDA would know better than I. But as far as I know, this thing is still just beating like a metronome. One of the nifty things about these uh, 51 peg systems, or, or as they're sometimes called hot Jupiters, is that you can put the entire thing on a piece of paper totally to scale. So the Jupiter-like planets are about a tenth the diameter of their host star. And uh, these things orbit at something like of order 10 stellar radii from the star. So everything here is absolutely to scale, which is something you can't do uh, with solar system planets. So one of the other really odd planets to emerge early on in this field uh, it was 16 Sig B. Uh, this was the initial discovery was October of 95. And uh, during the first six months of 1996, we announced about a half a dozen planets. And this is one of them. And uh, this is another truly bizarre planet. Uh, the orbital period is a little bit more normal in this case, a little bit more than two years. The amplitude is 50 meters a second, which tells us that this thing is of order uh, about two Jupiter masses. But the shape of the curve is absolutely not sinusoidal. It's more like a sawtooth. And that tells us that the orbit is not circular. Uh, so if you were to overlay the orbit of this thing on top of the solar system, uh, you see that uh, at the inner part of the orbit, it actually goes inside of the orbit of Venus, and the outer part of the orbit, it goes beyond Mars. So if we had such a planet in the solar system, we wouldn't be here. This thing would have gravitationally ejected us like a, a giant uh, bowling ball. So uh, systems like this were truly bizarre, uh, and they probably are not the ones that host life. So uh, this is what the field was like back then. Prior to the discovery of planets, everybody knew all planetary systems would look like our own. Uh, and then we get this flood of planets, and none of them even remotely resembles our own solar system. And people were just furiously scratching their heads. Um, I have to say, as an observer, it was actually a wonderful time, because there's nothing an observer likes more than confounding theorists. <laughs> uh, this was also a kind of a wacky time, because uh, back in these days, you discover a couple of giant planets, which are now relatively easy to discover, and you make a Time magazine. Uh, you, you don't get that kind of press coverage uh, for this sort of work anymore. So the first lesson that we learned, uh, even back in the late 90s, uh, is that uh, when we compared what we thought about planets and what actually emerged, uh, is that humans really aren't very bright. <laughs> We're not very imaginative and that everything that we had done up to that point was basically extrapolating on the solar system. So we were extrapolating from a sample of one. And in fact, when you do that, you're actually in a way worse case than if you're extrapolating from zero, where you're at least your imagination might begin to run wild. This is something I think about a lot. Uh, so um, we only have a very brief time to, to do this, so I'm gonna end here. And uh, Margaret, do you wanna do catch questions now or after the, uh, all three of us? Okay, all three. Okay, well, that's, that's it for the little intro, and uh, we're going to learn a lot more about planets with the next two talks, so thank you. I'm probably the last person you want manipulating this thing, so I'm just going to walk away. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Good evening, everyone. How's the sound? You guys can hear me OK? Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this very special week as we celebrate this uh, milestone of 20 years since the discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a sun-like star. Um, Paul has set the stage for us describing that watershed moment. Um, and I'm here to tell you about the next chapter. Uh, and its title is A Planet for Goldilocks. I think whether we knew it or not at the time, uh, a new pathway was being opened up for the search for evidence of life, not just beyond Earth, 
but beyond the solar system. That is the search for life on these exoplanets. Um, and, and so the question on our mind at that time was, okay, we're finding these planets, but, but they're very unlike Earth, right? Uh, these very first planets that Paul described were these hot Jupiters, these scorched worlds, giant gas balls like Jupiter and Saturn orbiting with an orbital period of just a few days. These things were tens of times closer to their host star than Mercury is to our own sun. Very, very different worlds. And so if you think, okay, I want to find evidence of life. I want to know if there's life out there. What is the next logical step? That next logical step was to find out if there were planets like Earth, these cradles of life, uh, at least life as we know it. And so over the ensuing years, we started pushing our technology to find ever smaller planets in ever more Earth-like orbits. Um, but, uh, you know, Paul just gave us this lesson, you know, we're not very bright. Um, but again, if you have to start someplace, you're going to ask yourself the question, where is life likely to lurk, given this one example of life that we have? Well, what we know about life on planet Earth is that no matter how diverse it is, uh, it's all carbon-based. And carbon-based chemistry, as we understand it, requires liquid water as the solvent to facilitate all of those chemical reactions that are important for sustaining life. So we're looking for planets that could have these, this mix of materials, the kind of stuff that our bodies are made out of, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, iron that is in our blood. We're looking for those kinds of elements. And where we find those is in the rocky cores of planets. Even Jupiter has a rocky core. But it's surrounded by an envelope of the most common element in the, in the universe, which is hydrogen and helium. So all of these hydrogen and helium rich molecules comprise a very thick shroud of an envelope around these planets. And by time you get down to the rocky core in the center, the pressures are so high that, that DNA, life as we know it, is not going to exist. So we don't want to look for planets that are too large, like the gas giants. We're looking for rocky planets. And we are looking for rocky planets where liquid water could possibly pool on the surface, liquid water being that common ingredient uh, that sustains life on planet Earth no matter where that life lurks, right? Uh, so we're looking for planets that are not too hot, not too cold, and therein lies this idea of a Goldilocks world, the just right world. And that's what we're looking for, are planets that are like Earth in this very simple sense in terms of its size and its temperature or energy, how much energy it's receiving from its parent star, and that's related to its orbital period, as we'll see in a second. Um, so it took many years before we got down to even Neptune-sized planets. Um, and in order to find these Earth-sized planets, we knew we needed a new technology, even today. The Doppler technique that Paul described does not have the capability of finding a true Earth-Sun analog. The precision is just not there yet, although we're working very hard to attain that goal. Um, so fast forward to uh, 2009, NASA launches a mission called Kepler, and I believe the principal investigator of that mission is in the audience. Is that you, Bill? Why don't you go ahead and stand up and get your due? due. <laughs> Bill was proposing a new technique for finding exoplanets. And he actually proposed this technique to NASA not once, not twice, not three times, no, not even four times. It wasn't until the fifth time uh, that Bill was successful in uh, selling his idea to NASA. And this is the science that I'm going to be describing to you in the next few slides, the results of this mission. Um, so fast forward to 2009, and Bill's dream was realized with the launch of NASA's Kepler mission. Kepler launched in March of 2009. It's a space telescope in orbit about the sun, not the Earth, but it orbits um, in a, with an orbital period around the sun similar to that of Earth. So it's kind of like a dog on a leash behind the Earth, drifting a little bit further away with time. 
It's a space telescope. The mirror is about one meter in diameter, and it stares at one patch of sky, or it did so for four years, measuring the brightnesses of 150,000 stars, waiting for the case where a planet in its orbit about the star would pass directly between the disk of the star and the telescope, and the telescope would perceive that as a momentary dimming of light, as you just saw in this animation. That is, the planet in its orbit about the star is casting a shadow out into the galaxy, and in some cases, those shadows will sweep across the face of the telescope. The telescope perceives that, measures that as a dimming of light. So what you see here is a, uh, well, what you did see here, <laughs> was a, uh, an image, the first light image, of that patch of sky in the galaxy, uh, containing about, well, a couple million of stars, millions of stars, actually, from our galaxy. Um, here is another snippet of that image. In the upper left-hand corner, every tiny white speck that you see is a star in our Milky Way galaxy in, a, in an area, a slice about the size of my hand on the sky. And you zoom in and you can see the pixelated image where the light falling on the detector is being converted into a voltage, which we can read out and we can measure as a brightness of that star by adding up all of those little voltages in the square. And so we get this brightness for all 150,000 stars simultaneously making a measurement once every 30 minutes for four years without blinking in the hopes of seeing these little dimmings of light that happen, they last a few hours, and they reoccur once every orbit. And so this was the methodology that Bill put forward uh, and, and convinced NASA that, that this had the capability of detecting a planet as small as an Earth in an Earth-like orbit, okay? And so here's that same pixel in the upper left-hand corner. In the middle of this diagram, we see some actual data from Kepler, every white point being a brightness measurement. And you see some fuzziness, which is the intrinsic noise or scatter of the measurements. But then you see this tiny dimming of light that occurs. Uh, and, and that dimming of light is going to tell you something about the size of the planet. A larger planet blocks out more light, and you get a deeper dimming of light. So, so Kepler allows us, through this technique, to measure the radius of the planet. Now, doing that for a planet like Jupiter, which is the size of this black dot, is pretty easy. Jupiter induces a dimming of light around a sun of about 1%. We can actually do that from the ground, and indeed that was done from the ground in about the year 2000, just before Kepler was selected for flight. Um, but doing this for an Earth is significantly more difficult because the, the size is so much smaller, 10 times smaller than Jupiter. In fact, the amount of dimming of light that an Earth causes crossing the disk of a sun-like star is one part per 10,000. So we imagine the Empire State Building, you know, 80 stories high, and it's night and every single window is illuminated, and one person goes to the blinds and lowers the blinds by a couple of centimeters. That's the precision that we have to achieve in order to make this possible. And, and that precision was achieved by the uh, talented engineers at Ball who built this spacecraft. So we measure the size by the dimming of light, and then we measure the orbital period of the planet by the amount of time it takes to complete or between these dimmings of light. Um, and the orbital period, Johannes Kepler told us in the 1600s, is directly related to the distance between the star and the planet itself. Right? There's, a, there's a relationship, a mathematical relationship. And so if you know the orbital period, you can get the distance to the star, and if you know how luminous that star is, it's like, a, like standing at a campfire, you can tell how much energy your hands would receive or how much energy that planet is receiving, and whether or not it's this just right world. Okay, so to um, summarize Kepler's science, I'm going to do it in a scattergram, a scatter plot. So on the y-axis, I have the radius of the planet in Earth units. So the number one corresponds to Earth size, which is marked by the horizontal line. On the x-axis is the orbital period of the planet. And so we see the years are ticking by from the time that that first 51 peg B was discovered up until the, the present time. Every point on this diagram is a exoplanet discovery um, made by any team excepting Kepler's. So I'm showing you the sum total of all discoveries as of 2015 um, excepting Kepler's. 
And what you notice in this diagram so far is that most of the planets lie above the Neptune line. Indeed, 85% of them lie above the Neptune line. Right? We see some patterns there. We've got the blue points that are from the Doppler method. We've got some pink points that are from this transit method, whereby you measure the dimming of light when a planet transits the face of the star. Um, but here it looks like Earth-sized planets, or Earth-like planets in terms of size, are, are rare. right? Um, but then enter Kepler. Kepler observes this one patch of sky for a full four years and searches the data for these dimmings of light. And now I will add to this diagram the Kepler discoveries. <laughs> Kepler lifted our blinders to the small planet populations in our galaxy, the planets that were there in great numbers that we didn't have the sensitivity to see. But with this new technology, now all of a sudden they became visible. There are over 4,000 yellow points there, many of them stacked on top of each other, so you can't even get, really get a sense for the sheer volume of discoveries that have been made. But what's really impressive about this diagram is that now 85% of the known planets are smaller than Neptune, which underscores their, their commonality in the galaxy. Uh, later you will hear about the future. Uh, you see that some of this diagram on the bottom right and on the right side of the diagram is still devoid of many planets. Um, and Alan Boss will tell you about future missions that will fill that in. So we still have blinders to the exoplanets that are out there in the galaxy, but at least for orbital periods less than three, four, five hundred, six hundred days, which is the edge of these yellow points and inward. And for planets that are Earth size and larger, now we are in a position to be able to understand the demographics of planets out in the galaxy. And that's really what Kepler was funded to do, to answer one very simple question. What is the fraction of stars in our galaxy that harbor potentially habitable Earth sized planets? That's the number that we want in order to design all of the future missions that are going to search for evidence of life beyond the solar system. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple of slides um, that kind of underscore the diversity of planets that have been seen in these last five years, five or six years. This is the same thing that I showed you before, but now in a bar graph format, just showing the number of discoveries for a certain orbital period regime as a function of planet size. So over here, we've got 1 to 1.4 Earth radius and smaller, and I've colored those blue. On the right-hand side, we've got kind of Neptune sizes and larger, I'm sorry, brown. Here I've colored them blue because there are these planets that have the gaseous envelopes. But what's remarkable is that the most common planet known to humanity right now is a kind of planet we don't even have in our own solar system. It's literally the gray area in between. And we're working very hard to understand what the composition of those planets are, um, if they're rocky, if they're gaseous, or some kind of a mix. So that's kind of the first lesson, is that nature is much more diverse. Planets are much more diverse than we thought they were. We've also found very exotic planets, uh, planets that are the size of Earth roughly, and they're rocky like Earth, and we know that from their density. But they're orbiting 20, 30 times closer to their host star than Mercury is to our own solar system. They have one entire hemisphere covered by an ocean, but it's not an ocean of liquid water, it's an ocean of molten rock or lava, because the temperatures on that star facing side are in excess of that required to melt iron, let alone rock. So these are very exotic worlds. We know that it's a rocky planet because we know its radius from the Kepler data, we know its mass from the Doppler wobble, and mass divided by volume is density, and that tells us that this is a rocky world. Taking that to even more of an extreme, we see planets orbiting even closer, where there's indication that the planet is literally disintegrating before our eyes. Um, this example, kick 12557548, we know that this has a comet-like tail of disintegrating material because the planet, when it crosses the disk of the star, it doesn't dim, go across, and then come back up in that nice, predictable way. It dims, goes across, and then slowly comes back up as that obscuring tail continues to block starlight. And this is what its data looks like. You see it doesn't have that same characteristic shape. Uh, we know that planets 
orbit not just one, but two stars. These are called circumbinary planets. Finally, we showed that George Lucas was right, although he got the star size wrong. Uh, this particular planet discovered by Kepler, this is an artist's rendering of that planet, uh, is Kepler 16. Uh, 16b is the planet, and it's orbiting a G and a K-type star, the G being the yellowish one. Um, but we do find Goldilocks planets as well, as after all, that was Kepler's goal. And right now, the one that holds the record is Kepler 452b. Its build is the most Earth-like planet so far. Again, that's only in terms of its size and its orbital period. Um, so here you've got a split screen infographic. On the left is Kepler is, is Earth at 365 day orbital period, and its sun there in the middle. And then on the right, you've got Kepler 452b, its star, its central host star is almost exactly the same size as the sun. It's a G-type star, a little bit older. It's about 6 billion years old. And the planet itself is orbiting at 385 days. So it's a very Earth-like orbit. The planet is 1.6 times the size of the Earth. We don't yet know its mass, so we don't know its density. We expect it might have some hydrogen and helium uh, envelope, uh, maybe an atmosphere, maybe, but we don't know what kinds of conditions that creates on the surface, whether or not it'll have continents, plate tectonics, all of these interesting things that, of course, are very important for life. So I, I want to end by um, just touching upon the statistics, right? I said Kepler is a statistical mission. Here's the yellow cone, which is Kepler's search space. Um, so, so those are the stars that we are surveying, and from the discoveries in that yellow cone, we aim to determine this number, the fraction of stars harboring, harboring potentially habitable Earth-sized planets. And so the way I'd like to communicate that result to you so far, um, the results to date, uh, let's consider the galaxy. This is a representation of the Milky Way. And let's scale the continental United States to the size of the galaxy, right? And here we are in Washington, D.C. on the East Coast, and we stand there and we look across the continental United States and we ask ourselves, where is the nearest potentially habitable planet likely to be, based on these statistics from Kepler? And the answer, it turns out to be, is right about just short of DuPont Circle. <laughs> Very close, OK? Um, yeah, on this scale, it's just 0.23 miles away. So what this tells us is that Earth-sized planets abound in our galaxy. Goldilocks zone planets the size of Earth abound in our galaxy. And if we go back to this diagram, if you look in the center, there's a red dot. Do you see the red dot in the middle of the crosshairs? <coughs> So the distance in our galaxy that this exercise corresponded to was three parsecs, which translates to about 10 light years. 10 light years is the distance to the nearest potentially habitable exoplanet with 95% likelihood. Um, so that dot more or less represents about 10 light years. Here is a uh, diagram or a, a little visualization from the recon survey. This is about three times the volume. This is the solar neighborhood colored by the type of the star. The red dots are the, are the small M-type stars. The K dwarfs are, are orange. And the stars, like our sun, are yellow. You can see from this diagram that the majority of the stars in the solar neighborhood, and actually in the galaxy as well, um, are these M-type stars, these cool red, red stars. So again, this volume is more like 30 light years across, so three times the radius of this distance to the nearest exoplanet, or 27 times the volume. So even in this tiny solar neighborhood, we expect there to be some tens, maybe a few dozen Earth-sized planets in the Goldilocks zone. So just to end, um, 20 years of progress. We've made orders of magnitude progress in the radii of planets that we are discovering, in their masses, in their orbital period, in their relationship to planet Earth. Um, and what's exciting about this last 20 years is we look forward to the next 20 years and we, and we realize clearly how much is possible, how much is yet to come. And so Alan is going to now talk about that bright future for exoplanet 
And uh, I think that you will all find that the search for evidence of life is looming in the near-term future. Maybe not mine, because I'm rather old, but certainly um, for our, our children and grandchildren. I think it's a very tangible goal. So, out. Okay, thank you, Natalie. Uh, when we were planning this, uh, this evening's events uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we had several things in mind. One was, of course, as you pointed out, uh, that um, this is 20 years after uh, the October 6th announcement of 51 PEG by Michelle Mayor and Dia Kahlo. Uh, but yesterday also was the 20th anniversary of the publication in the Washington Post of the confirmation by Paul Butler and Jeff Marcy, and so we're really close to that pivotal event, and I will point out that the Washington Post confirmation was published on the front page of the Washington Post, whereas the Maylor and Kalo uh, announcement was published on page A37. So it made it in section A, but didn't make it on the front page. Uh, the Marcy and Butler one was below the fold, though, on the front page, so it wasn't quite uh, right up there. But more importantly, October 21st, uh, 2015 is, of course, important because that was the date that uh, Marty McFly typed in the DeLorean and Back to the Future. And so tonight I'm going to be effectively your Marty McFly and take you into the future and tell you that uh, in spite of the fantastic things you heard from Paul and Natalie for what's happened the last 20 years, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get even better. So let me start off with the uh, future of ground-based astronomy. Uh, shown here a couple of uh, highlighted a couple of uh, Carnegie telescopes from starting with the uh, the Hooker and the, the Hale 200 inch. Uh, primarily the uh, workhorses are the Magellan telescope, 6.5 meter in size, uh, and Carnegie is currently planning the giant Magellan telescope, which you'll see another graphic of in a moment. Why do astronomers keep wanting bigger and bigger telescopes? Well, two reasons. If you're building a spectrometer, you want to have a lot of photons. If you make a telescope twice as big, you have four times as many photons, you can do things four times as fast. If you're trying to do direct imaging and resolve things, you make a telescope ten times as large, you can see things ten times smaller. So that's the motivation, but of course these are ground-based telescopes, and so the problem is the atmosphere is making it a little bit harder, shall we say. But astronomers have figured out clever ways to take out of the blurring effects of the atmosphere. On the existing Magellan telescopes, in the last couple of years, we've developed the MAG-AO system, Magellan Adaptive Optics, which allows you, by looking at a nearby bright natural star or a potentially a laser star, you take out the wave fronts that uh, are blurring your image, and when you turn the MAG-AO on, you can see things you could not see at all. So here's an image of a star uh, which looks sort of blurry, maybe it seems elongated. When you turn on the MAG-AO, you realize it's actually a binary star, and this sort of separation is comparable or better to what can be done with the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble is above the atmosphere, so it doesn't have the atmospheric seeing effect, but of course it's only 2.4 meters in diameter, whereas Magellan is 6.5, so Magellan can be quite competitive with something like that. So the hope is then, of course, that when the giant Magellan Telescope is up and running in the early 2020s, uh, with essentially a, a set of seven mirrors, which are 25 meters in diameter, uh, you will be able to do things uh, you know, 25 times better in terms of resolving power than a one meter telescope. I should also point out this is of course an artist's conception because you would never ever want to open up your dome like this in the middle of the day. You keep the dome shut, you will never see this in reality, believe me. Okay, but there's not of course just the giant Magellan telescope being proposed, there are several other next generation large telescopes, uh, which I, I must mention as well. The 30 meter telescope up here in the upper right being proposed for Mauna Kea, as well as the Europeans extremely large telescope being uh, proposed and, and already has a mountaintop leveled up in, in northern Chile about uh, a couple hundred miles uh, farther north than Carnegie's Las Campanas Observatory. So the, these are going to be telescopes of the future which will do wonderful things. I should say also that um, in particular the Giant Magellan Telescope, one of its first uh, instruments will be a so-called G-clef spectrometer which will be doing the sorts of Doppler precision measurements that Paul has made famous uh, and doing it even faster because it'll be a new spectrometer with high precision with an incredible light gathering power. In addition, uh, eventually the giant Magellan telescopes will have adaptive optics put in as well and so we hope to use GMT for doing direct imaging of uh, large, luminous, perhaps distant planets around nearby stars. Okay, now let's go into space. 
So right now, I'm trying to look in the future. There is an existing space telescope up there. The Europeans launched a few years ago called Gaia. Uh, it will be getting its data. It's basically a five, five and a half year prime mission. So by 2019, we'll start getting data back from Gaia. Gaia is important because it is basically mapping the entire sky. It's doing the most precise measurements yet of the astrometric locations of basically a billion stars in our galaxy. That's basically one out of every 100 stars in the galaxy it will tell us exactly what its distance is. And once you take out its distance, its so-called parallax and proper motion due to the Earth's motion around the sun as well as the stars motion across the sky, if you see any leftover wobble, that means that star must have a planet in orbit around it, making it wobble around the center of mass, just like Doppler velocity picks up wobbles of a star around the center of mass of the system the astrometric wobble on the sky will tell you there's a planet there as well. It's thought that Gaia will perhaps find several tens of uh, 10,000 or so Jupiter mass objects. So that'll be an enormous advance for finding a uh, relatively short period, less than five year orbital period Jupiters around an incredibly large population of our galaxy. Next step after that comes back to the United States. Uh, the test spacecraft is being built right now for getting ready for a launch in August of 2017. This will be basically a follow-on to Kepler in some sense, but whereas Kepler was staring, at, as Natalie said, at one field of view for four years continuously and finding an incredible number of stars with having planets, but they're all sort of too far away to be followed up with many space telescopes because they're too faint, TESS is going to be doing an all-sky survey of the very brightest stars in the solar neighborhood. So it's going to be doing uh, studies of basically 500,000 stars and staring at them for roughly one month apiece. Then it'll go to the next piece of sky and it'll be mapping all the way around the sky. And using rather, rather modest, you might say, telescopes, there are four telescopes here with wide angle lenses. The size of the telescope is actually only four inches. So if you ever had like a Quest Star telescope when you were a kid, it's the size of a Quest Star inside a, a, a space based telescope, which will do again some tremendous stuff. Uh, the predictions are that it should basically find several thousand. Uh, transiting planets, of which perhaps a thousand or so or, or 500, will be Earth size or super Earth size around nearby stars, perhaps M dwarfs. And even though the orbital periods will be rather short, because it's only going to stare at a given uh, field area for maybe a month or so, so their orbital periods will be short. If you're around an M dwarf star, an orbital period of a few weeks is enough to put you inside the habitable zone, because M dwarf stars are so faint that you can still have liquid water on a short period orbit. So the nice thing about TESS is, especially with its launch, is that it'll be ready for the following year when JWST is launched. And JWST observing time will be very precious. And so you want to know ahead of time where to point JWST, because this is a major flagship mission for NASA. And JWST will be looking at an observing list chosen largely by TESS to look at some nearby M dwarfs and, and check to see how the spectra of the combined star planet system varies as the planet transits in front of and behind the star. If you separate, you can imagine you know, taking three spectra, planet plus star, star plus planet on the front, star only, no planet here, and you subtract all three of them, you can learn an awful lot about the atmosphere of that exoplanet. And the hope is that you'll be able to find up some of the biosignatures in those spectra and tell us something about whether or not these M dwarf super Earths might be habitable. And the estimates are that you, know, you should basically should be able to find a, a handful of these objects that JWST will be able to st uh, study in some detail. After that comes the next big uh, decadal survey uh, telescope, uh, which is, was, was uh, supported by the Astro 2010 Decadal Survey called the W First Telescope. It was originally uh, built to be motivated by dark energy and microlensing surveys searches. But then, and at that point, uh, given the budget constraints at NASA, the, the, the design reference missions that were being planned were relatively modest space telescopes. They're only one meter to one and a half meter in diameter, because that's all the money we thought we had for it. But then nicely, a few years ago, the National Reconnaissance Office said, well, you know, we've got a couple of basically Hubble quality space optics sitting in a, in a, in a cold room up in upstate New York, and uh, you can have them, NASA. And NASA said, yeah, I think we'll take that. Uh, so they basically now are proposing not a one or one and a half meter telescope, but a 2.4 meter space telescope using the free complete optical assemblies which come from the National Reconnaissance Office. And because this telescope is of course now bigger than the ones considered, it means it can do the primary missions in some sense faster, which means there's now some time to do something else. And so I'll show you in a moment some of the other things that will be done with this wonderful new asset that uh, NASA has accomplished. But its primary mission in terms of planet finding is to do microlensing planet search. Microlensing is something that 
Einstein uh, predicted back in the 1930s. He didn't think it would ever be practical because he didn't understand the technology he would have now for doing large cameras with very uh, precise measurements. But the idea is basically if you happen to be staring at a background star, like towards the, the bulge of our galaxy where uh, there's an incredible rich field of stars, and if you notice this background star, and if a foreground star, which you don't even see, happens to pass in front of your star at just the right alignment, the gravitational field effect of the mass of the star, Einstein predicted, will bend the light subtly towards you. So you'll see the background star mysteriously brighten for about a month and then come back down again. Very strange effect. The only explanation for it is that there is something passed in front. If in addition this foreground star happens to have a planet, on top of that month-long brightening, there may be a one or two-day spike where the planet also adds to the gravitational focusing. And so if you see this rather characteristic signature of a month-long brightening with a one or two-day spike, you can interpret that with a little bit of modeling as a planet uh, in orbit around that foreground star. And in fact, I'm happy to say that the very first microlensing detection was done at the Carnegie Las Cabanas Observatory by our, our Polish colleagues using the Warsaw 1.3-meter telescope. And uh, unfortunately, this is just an artist's conception because it looks better than the actual image of the, the star, which looks pretty dull. Uh, and that, you're not going to get on the front page of the Washington Post with that, I'm afraid. Uh, but the, the science is still equally profound. So uh, WFIRST was intended to do this microlensing survey. And the very nice thing about it is, and I'm sure one of the reasons why it was so convincing to the Astro 2010 panel is that WFIRST is very complementary to what we knew Kepler would be doing. Kepler is sensitive to rather short period orbits, basically orbits with uh, you know, less, than, uh, less than one year or so because it's, it was able to take data for four years if you want to see several transits occur to make sure you understand it. So it's primarily going to find objects with orbits inside the Earth's orbit if you're thinking in terms of the scale of, uh, of our solar system. So you're filling out the short period orbits. WFIRST is the exact opposite. It's most sensitive to things which are farther away. Basically, in terms of the scale of our solar system, it's basically the asteroid zone and beyond, and even out to tens of AU. So WFIRST microlensing will be filling out the census for the, uh, the middle to the outer portion of the solar system, which is very nice. It'll give us a much more complete census of what we know about extrasolar planets. And then, as I hinted before, because of this larger aperture of this telescope, there's a little bit of extra time, you might say, to do something else. And uh, the decadal survey last time around said, you know, NASA really should be putting some effort into figuring out a way to do a direct imaging mission in space. And so cleverly, NASA came up with a way of doing that. There is now built into the baseline design for the telescope uh, a, a, a culting mass chronograph, which is going to entail two different versions of a chronograph, which is basically a very fancy way of putting your thumb on on the star and blotting out the starlight so you can see a planet around it. As, as, as uh, Paul pointed out, planets, even Jupiter mass, Jupiter size and mass planets are roughly a billion times fainter than the host star. Earth is maybe uh, 10 billion times fainter. So it's a pretty tough project. And it's a little bit tougher because with the AFTA telescope, the National Reconnaissance Office uh, telescope has spiders which produce extra diffracted light. But the uh, folks who designed chronographs got some rather clever designs, and you can see this rather peculiarly structured uh, chronographic mask for the so-called shape pupil design. And they've shown in the lab that this thing will actually perform to quite good contrast of orders uh, 10 to the minus 8 here. And that's just, this is as of a year or two ago. They're continuing to improve that. And so there are two designs being carried forward. There, there was a shootout a couple of years back trying to figure out which ones are the best ones. And these two have, have uh, advanced as being basically ready for, for flight development. And ongoing work is being, uh, continues to this day about it, out at JPL as well as our colleagues at Princeton University. So the hope is that we'll be able to have a direct imaging chronograph capability on WFIRST AFTA in addition to the uh, microlensing survey. So there's great potential there. And for, especially for imaging, uh, with contrast that cannot be done on the ground. So here's a plot of the contrast achievable with various telescopes. Here's Earth down here. Here's the holy grail in this box here, the separation. If you're pretty far away and, and a bright planet, it's not too hard to see. These are some uh, uh, self-luminous plants which have been already observed by either uh, uh, ground-based adaptive optics imaging. Here's GPI instrument down at uh, 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 the Gemini South Telescope. It's sort of the state of the art. JWST will not, was not designed to do this, so it's not going to function very well for direct imaging. Uh, even the European Extremely Large Telescope is not going to quite do as well as we hope the WFIRST AFTA will do. And so while WFIRST AFTA will not quite be able to get to Earth's, 
We'll certainly be able to do Jupiter, Saturn's, as well as a number, uh, a couple dozen or so of the known radial velocity planets. So we know for sure we'll be able to image these as well as you can imagine. If you can imagine you know, the, how the Kepler search space is filled out saying you know, there are a lot more smaller guys and bigger guys, you can imagine there are gonna be lots of things in here that w first will be able to image as well. All right, so that takes us up to maybe 2025 or so. What's next? Well, believe it or not, it's already time at NASA headquarters to start planning for the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. And uh, Paul Hertz and uh, folks at the Astrophysics Division have uh, we're having a meeting this week actually at Goddard to talk about what sort of mission should be developed in anticipation of the Astro 2020. And there are four missions that uh, make perfect sense based on the previous work that had been done in, in putting together roadmaps, as well as uh, what was hinted about in the Astro 2010 Decadal Survey. And the two of perhaps most interest for direct imaging are a habitable exoplanet imaging space telescope, which is sort of notionally thought of as something roughly eight meters in size, which is achieved contrast at 10 to the minus 10, or perhaps a much larger UV optical infrared surveyor, perhaps as large as 16 meters. So those are the ideas that we'll be discussing later on this week at Goddard. And uh, I'm sure Paul Hertz will, I hope that he will accept the recommendations that are coming out. And which one of those will be chosen? Uh, you know, we're not quite sure. The, these are again notional concepts for what these might be. Uh, it could be something like the old TPF chronograph, which was an eight, eight by three and a half meter off axis telescope. So it didn't have the obscurations that AFTA has. With a, with a big uh, star shade around it. Uh, that is poss one possible concept for HabX. Could also be, a, a, instead of a chronograph, it could have a star shade, where you fly a separate, very cleverly designed, opaque shield, which blocks out the starlight and does, it's a very fancy thumb, basically. And if you just put it at the right distance, uh, it will do a wonderful job also for allowing you to see planets. Or it could be that perhaps uh, this even larger concept of at last, which is, a, again, a notional concept that was proposed a while back, well, perhaps this one will win. And the question is, which one will it be? Well, that is to be determined, because that's up to the uh, Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. So let me just finish by saying, uh, showing you this incredible sweep of missions we've had from NASA to start. Uh, this sweep includes Hubble and Spitzer, which were basically designed and flown long before we even had any extrasolar planets. They were not planned for extrasolar planets, but they still both functioned extremely well doing exoplanet science. Kepler is our first planned mission. And you can see the tremendous results we've gotten out of Kepler. So the other ones, you can just imagine, well, you know, the more you start planning missions to really do exoplanets, you're going to do even better and better. So things can only get better. TESS, JWST, WFIRST, AFTA, and then this New World's Telescope, which are not quite clear what that will be. There are a couple of images there that are possible. Uh, but in addition, there is ground-based work going on. There's the Large Binocular Telescope Interferometer, which is underway right now out in, uh, in Arizona. It'll be doing a very important thing for looking for debris disks and understanding to what extent our imaging surveys will be compromised or complicated by background zodiacal light that might make it hard to find the planets. There's a new precision dedicated Doppler spectrometer that uh, NASA and NSF are supporting. And in addition, of course, we have a whole other uh, set of colleagues across the pond. The Europeans have been act equally active and interested in all of the science. Uh, they had launched the Crow mission shortly before Kepler launched. Uh, they have Gaia flying right now. Cheops is basically a clone of Crow. Cheops will be doing follow-up transit spectroscopy of just a few targets. We'll not be doing searches. It'll be doing more focused spectroscopy on known transiting planets. They also have plans to launch Plato, which will be another transit search telescope in the future. So, that's basically where we are right now. And as I said at the beginning, I mean, if you think what we've seen so far is, is exciting, uh, it can only get better. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite Paul and Natalie back to the stage to take some of your questions. If the Earth were placed uh, 30 light years away, um, at similar distance to these uh, exoplanets that you uh, found, and that planet were emitting energy into space just as the Earth has done historically, would we be able to detect 
transmissions from the planet? Do we have the technology to do that? And, and, and I would assume that the, the speed of these signals is the same as the speed of the light that, you're, uh, that you are observing, and I would think that that information would be all combined together and we would be receiving that today. You mean actually you, just, you want to see the reflected light from the, from yeah. the Earth, assuming yeah, it had a star? You're no? You're talking about SETI, like research, uh, I'm sorry, uh, radio signals, yes. like the SETI. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Alan, I'll you can you take that out. one. <laughs> That's not our area of expertise. Um, there's nobody up here representing <sighs> SETI research. Um, do you mean from like television programs and things yes. like that? Yeah. Well, yeah. I think our strongest source or our strongest emanations are not actually I Love Lucy broadcasts. They are the early warning radars over the North Pole, which for decades were searching for Soviet ICBMs coming at us and probably had Soviet look, radars looking that way. But those, I think, are the brightest objects we've had. And whether or not they would be detectable at 30 light years, I don't know. But I, that would be the one I would look at first. My, my, my understanding is that we would be able to detect a directed emission. So not just diffuse kind of, you know, I love Lucy, but if, it, if somebody were out there directing radiation towards us, then that's what we have the technology to do. Uh, well, up to now, that might change. As you've heard, there's been a significant investment in SETI research as made recently, so that might open up new, new sensitivity. Um, so you, you mentioned that the Kepler mission has uncovered this, the most abundant class of plan planets seem to be of a certain size range that we don't see in our solar system. So I was wondering if you have some speculation as to why we might not see that size range. And it, would it have anything to do with the orbital shapes being different in different solar systems? So Alan is an expert in the theory of planet formation, but before I turn it over to him, <laughs> let me make one small clarification. Oh, right, yeah, I'm a biologist. Um, so planet. those, what we call super-Earth slash sub-Neptune kinds of planets, um, they're not necessarily the most abundant type of planet in the galaxy, but they're the most common planet known to us right now. In other words, of the planets that we have discovered, that comprises the class that are most populous. Oh, right. um, but when you do all of the bias right. corrections with regards to what we actually see, when you try and map the, the population of things that we've discovered to the intrinsic population of planets that are in the galaxy, that requires some bias corrections. And when you do that, it looks like that the smallest planets are the most common. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that we don't have any of those in our own solar system. Right, right. So what do you know, Alan? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this won't take too long because we don't know much. Uh, you know, as Paul says, uh, observers love to thrash on theorists, and we're not even putting up a fair fight at this point because we've, never, we've not been able to predict anything to speak of. In fact, we're having a hard time even explaining what's been seen. So I would basically put the box score as observers 4,000, theorists sure. zero. <laughs> we, we can't even truly understand the formation of all the gas giant planets in our solar system, although people claim to make it, that's still, still dubious. Uh, but to be more specific about the Kepler relatively short period super Earths, there were published papers by several groups predicting a planet desert, right where this huge clump of planets came out of. And the theorists who did these population synthesis models, they've got lots of novels to turn and so on. They still cannot really successfully model what's been seen. There. So we're missing some basic details in our theoretical modeling. So we can only humbly learn, you know, it's that we are not worthy thing. We, like we really that. have to yield to, to these folks because they, they, they rule. Is there, within the future, is there a direction to try and develop the spectroscopy or whatever to analyze the atmospheres of, of the planets and determine uh, if or if there's any type of climate or those kinds of things. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, there's this dynamic duo, which is TESS and JWST that Alan talked about. TESS is going to find nearby planets. It's going to survey the whole entire sky, not just that one cone, you know, going out 3,000 light years, but nearby. And then JWST is going to be able to do something called transmission spectroscopy, whereby you collect the light 
that's coming from the star when the planet passes in front. And so that starlight is filtering through the atmosphere that's on the limb. And when it does that, the atmosphere is leaving its fingerprint on the light that you collect. And so there you can spread that light into a spectrum and you can try and find what that atmosphere is made out of. And TESS plus JWST is going to do that in spades for these super Earth sub-Neptunes. That's really where we're going to learn what these planets are made out of and what, what and they're like. And temperature and things like that. Temperature, I think pressure profiles. Yeah, exactly. Don't feel bad about your theoretical problems. I mean. Uh, the definition of an economist is somebody who tries to see if something that works in practice is, in fact, theoretically possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Fair enough, fair enough. But I did have a question that followed on to the other question, which is um, you were talking about seeing planets basically based on the physical characteristics and now looking at the, the chemical composition. Can you? Um, say things about the chemical composition of planets that are too far out to determine how big they are or how fast they're going, but is it possible still to get the spectrosco uh, spectroscopic information about them, or can we just not find them at all? Outside too, the range of... Too, uh, too far out in terms of distance? Too far from us. Distance from us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could take that. There's a, uh, I, I did not, I, I should have shown this now famous image, but there's a system called HR8799, which has four multiple Jupiter mass objects out of distances of, of six to uh, 30 or 40 AU. And those are directly imaged. One can put a spectrograph on them and look for signatures of things like carbon dioxide and methane in their atmospheres. And I don't remember exactly which molecules have been seen. I think it's a little bit, uh, it's still something that folks are arguing about, but those directly imaged teles uh, planets, which is one of the motivations for the WFIRST chronograph, because that will also be doing spectra, for those directly imaged ones, by golly, you can actually study the atmosphere as, as it is, as opposed to having to wait for it to for only do the systems where you have transits, where you have that special chance. So if, if it's a directly imaged planet, by golly, you will be looking for the atmosphere as well. But you, you asked a question about distance. You know, why is it that we need to find the nearest planets in order to do this, right? So there, there are two reasons. One, you know, we want to put up this giant thumb in the sky so that we can see the planet orbiting next to it, right? The planets are going to be very faint. They're like 10 billion times fainter than the star that they orbit, right? So we're photon starved which means we want the planets or the systems to be very close to us because brightness drops off as one over the distance squared. So, so that's one reason. The second reason is we don't want to put up our thumb and cover both the star and the planet, right? And as these systems get further and further away, you know, they, they shrink, right? So that's why we want the very nearest of, of systems in order to see these <laughs> Earth-like planets. That's all the 99% of the photon, or especially the more or less visible light uh, oriented area. But what about, um, say, radio telescopes or quasars or, you know, more exotic uh, ah. sources of energy? Are we completely blind about whether these have planets or is there something a little bit exotic that can be done even uh, far out of the environment that you're talking about? The Hubble Space Telescope did early on a rather innovative search around a M67 a globular cluster and did a transit survey where they used a lot of Hubble Space Telescope time and did find a few transiting planets, not as quite as many as they thought, in part because the globular cluster is a rather active environment. But there have been some, some uh, such systems found, and there have been pulsar planets found as well. It wasn't accentuated in our talks tonight, but pulsar planets are actually one of the first planetary mass objects found. There's even a pulsar-related planet in the M4 globular cluster. So their astronomers are very clever. They now realize that if you look anywhere hard enough, you're likely to find a planet, and they love to be the first one to discover it. So there's a lot of motivation to find them in exotic environments. Let me just also say, in relation to what you were talking about wanting to find the closest planets, one can imagine that when we find evidence from TESS and from JWST that there really are some close by, maybe a few parsec away stars that might have uh, some M dwarfs that have habitable worlds that look like they've got methane and carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and water and ozone. Uh, yeah, I can think that uh, some future NASA will want to you know, send a little tiny camera. You know, it may take 100 years to get there, but the light will come back in a couple of years. And you know, I would like to be around when that picture comes back. Better eat your I, probably not, but I, I won't be here. But you know, I, 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 so I, I'm supposed to save my children. You know. I, 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 I still want to see it, though. 
I, I recently came to understand that our end comes in about 200 million years when our sun collides with its nearest neighbor star. And since I learned that, I've been wondering about whether we might, in that time, uh, uh, gather the capacity to jump to another star. And I wonder if you all have ever thought of yourselves as the earliest scouts looking around for uh, some place where, uh, you know, after 100 million years, uh, halfway to our perdition, uh, we might make the jump uh, to another star uh, technically possible. Have you ever thought of such a thing or not? When, when Kepler found its first rocky planet and we did the media announcement, I was preparing for that press event the night before, and I, I, I know that Kepler 10, the, the star is something like 500 light years away, and I just went to the year, I, I googled the year that was our current date minus 500 years, and of course it came up the dawn of the age of exploration. <laughs> And I, I mean, of course, of course we find parallels, right? I mean, we're, we're searching for new worlds and, and, uh, and all of that. We can't help but think about that. And, and I do hope that we leave this planet one day and become an interstellar species because I think about how life evolved when it went from water to land and I wonder why, what possibilities might be unlocked when we go from land to space, of course. So you had mentioned a possible stellar collision in 200 million years. I don't think we can predict the orbits of our, our stellar companions in the galaxy of that precision over that time scale. But we know for sure that the sun will become a red giant in about 5 billion years or so. So we've got you know, 5 billion years to, to get the hell off of the planet. <laughs> I think we have just enough time, given that uh, constraint, to take one more question from each side. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite a segue, yeah. <laughs> Think you're next. Um, so, with moons such as like Europa and Titan being um, possible um, life bearing moons, is there any possibility for observation of uh, exosolar moons and um, obser observation of their uh, possible atmosphere and um, possible life conditions, not only based on their um, orbital period and distance from the star? Um, but also how they're related to their uh, host planet. It's an excellent question. Do you want to take this? Well, this is actually a question for you because the way you would find a moon orbiting a planet is in transit right now. The Doppler velocity is all we see is the combined mass of whatever is there, a planet and a moon. But it's the transit technique that can distinguish a planet from a moon. Yeah, 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 sir. I mean, certainly folks have searched the Kepler database looking for a moons as well, and there are plans with the future missions with tests and, and other things to, to keep looking, but no one's found a moon yet. I mean, Not Natalie, yet. you know. Not it, yet. They're looking hard in the Kepler data to see. I mean, in theory, you should be able to see one, but they're very difficult to detect because they don't have the same repeat repeatability that planets have. Um, but yes, people are looking. They haven't found any yet, but that said, there are, I think, over 100 giant planets in the Goldilocks zone, so that makes it a very interesting region for Pandora-like scenarios. As a theorist, I will predict there are moons out there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, aside from detecting a signal from an intelligent civilization out there, what would be the methods for uh, detecting life beyond the solar system? Go ahead. Well, the, the, the main uh, biological markers to look for are oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, and ozone as a proxy. And particularly if you can find ozone or oxygen along with methane, it's probably not an abiotic source for both of them. The, the thought is that probably you may have something like photosynthesis going on because otherwise the, the oxygen will burn the methane and you won't have, you will not have, you'll have one or the other, but not both. So if you see a planet with an abnormally high level of both of those, the feeling is it's probably something is going on there that is uh, not abiotic processes. Uh, that's the most direct way we have right now. People talk about other biological markers, so other things are being proposed, but those are the, the classic simple ones. And I should say that uh, uh, carbon uh, dioxide, carbon monoxide, water, and oxygen have all been seen in the atmospheres of other, other planets, but they're tr uh, mostly these transiting hot Jupiter. So it's not a place where you can actually look for life, but we've proven the concept of being able to you know, primarily through Spitzer and Hubble observations, detect those, those four biomarker uh, molecules. 
And the, the other gentleman asked about moons, right? Um, brought up Europa. I mean, there really are three pathways for finding evidence of life beyond, this, beyond Earth. One is to look at solar system, right? At, at the solar system planets like Europa, like Enceladus. We will go to Mars. We know it had water once. We saw liquid water running just recently. Um, so we'll go there, dig around, look in subterranean caves. Who knows what might be lurking in these places? Maybe on Europa there is life lurking underneath the ice cap in this liquid ocean that we believe exists. Um, but for this other path of exoplanets, we are really right now limited to these atmospheric diagnostics because that's what's remotely observable, right? So we're not looking for life. We're not designing experiments to look for life that hides in niches and nooks and crannies. We're looking for evidence of living worlds where life has really taken hold of the entire planet and is evidenced in the atmospheric chemistry. Yeah, in that context of looking for life, not only inside our solar system, but outside, I should point out that three of the most important people in the world from the U.S. point of view are actually sitting in the audience today. There, there's Jim Green, who's the head of the Planetary Science Division, Paul Hertz, head of the Astrophysics Division, and right next to him is Charlie Bolden, NASA Administrator. So you guys should stand up so we can clap for you guys, too. So. Keep the money coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you've seen, we have much to celebrate and much to look forward to. And let's thank our speakers again for sharing it with us. <laughs> thank you all again for joining us tonight. As you leave, I encourage you to uh, be either pick up a pamphlet or visit the events page on our website to look at when the next Carnegie Science or Capital Science Evening Lecture is and join us then. You're not old. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see these white hairs? That means nothing. <laughs>